and welcome along to Off the Court with me, Caroline Barker, her Tamsin Greenway, and him, Casey Jacks. How are we this week? We are good, good thank you. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's his dragon. It's his fave. I've been told to keep this really short because we've got so many guests, but I want to. There you go. Who cares if we have to cut down, you know, some of our other guests? We've got to see that, right? Uh, <laughs> there is plenty to talk about this week. We have coming up on the way. The head honcho, the president of the INF, Liz Nichols with us. We've got Gary Burgess, him, the singing sensation. Uh, he's also an umpire and brilliant with that as well. We'll get an update on rules and everything else besides. And Ziggy Berger, Zigga Zig Ah, One Direction, huge fan on a new section we're calling Ziggy in the Middle. A little bit of an update on some news this week. We've heard then there's been another meeting of the teams and the ball within the Vitality Netball Super League. We're not going to see any play definitely before the 31st of May, they're going to have another meeting mid-May, but in all likelihood, Tamsin, when you look at what's happening, when you hear what's the advice coming out from the government, we're not going to see crowds at a Super League game until, what, January, probably, probably. So just briefly, have you changed your mind on whether we should see games played behind closed doors? I think if we can still run something before the end of the season, use it as a perfect um, example, opportunity to perhaps try and stream more stuff, play more stuff out. Um, live it would be great uh, whether that can happen who knows I don't want to give up on it yet because I'm ever the optimist all right let's get to the word from the horse's mouth shall we go to the very top Hannah Wilkes has been talking to INF president Liz Nickel. well Liz Nickel, thank you so much for talking to us unprecedented times for all of us and for sport globally how as a governing body is the INF approaching this crisis from a sporting perspective uh, well, we, uh, as you say, everybody in sports is experiencing something quite unique now. And, um, you know, when, when you're at, a, at an international strategic level, um, it's always important to look at the, uh, at the present and the future. Um, and um, so the, the present is, is dominated now by, by uh, managing this virus scenario and actually being in touch with our members around the, the world much more frequently to understand uh, where each of the regions is. The national associations and national member bodies are actually having to work really hard to engage with their members to make sure they're providing uh, support, advice, guidance, uh, to remain connected um, and to ensure our netballers, whether they're volunteers or they are players, uh, are, you know, remain fit and healthy over this period. A world calendar is something that's been discussed a lot in the, in the media over here in the UK. When you look at the sport globally, and we've got this pause where nothing is happening, from your perspective, is, is there a chance here to create one? Because the national leagues do a lot of good, but there's still a little bit of disconnect around the globe. Absolutely. That's one of our top priorities. We're now working on, a, uh, on, a, on an event and commercial strategy for the future of our game. Um, but it does mean uh, that there's got to be uh, collaboration around the world. Um, but it has to fit alongside big chunks of the season that are uh, where the Super Leagues play. And um, in, particularly in Australia and New Zealand, England and, and in South Africa. Uh, but these leagues are really important in terms of athlete development. It's made an, 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 they've made an enormous impact on on the, uh, the, on the game, on, on the athletes, uh, on the players. I mean, call them players, but they are athletes now because they are really having top quality competition more often. And you can see how that plays out at an international level. So getting the balance right is important. Um, so I think it's a phased calendar uh, and a phased calendar that acknowledges community activity, national activity and international activity. Um, and I think, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure we'll get there for the greater good of the game. How much, of, how much of a priority is it for the INF to, to make sure leagues continue to professionalise because of the benefits that that brings to the game in terms of standard and profile? Oh, they're massively important. The, the leagues around the, uh, the Super Leagues are massively important. They've been a game changer, uh, no doubt about it. One of the big challenges about this, this virus scenario is that those that, are, those that have been really successful in generating commercial income and growing products that actually rely on that commercial income and a uh, gate gate receipts uh, are now the most vulnerable uh, in this in this because of the, because of the 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 lack of activity now um, and so um, so we we're very conscious that uh, we have to do whatever we can to 
uh, support them in the challenges that they've got over this period so we can get through it uh, even stronger and we all look forward to getting back to business as usual. Uh, it looks like it's going to be 2021 now, doesn't it? Oh, don't say that. No, I'm going to stay positive. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Um, netball then has been riding a, a real wave, especially in the UK, since that Commonwealth uh, gold medal win a couple of years ago, hosting the Netball World Cup last summer. Um, what are your plans for the sport as a brand? How do you want netball to be seen globally? Well, I'm, well, I'm really impressed by, by everybody that I come across in the netball world whose motives are selfless, absolutely selfless. They want to do what's best for the for the for the athletes, the players, the game, and uh, and make a difference to the lives of, of of young women and girls in particular. Although we are an open sport, um, because everybody that has come through netball and my, I count myself in this has grown as an individual and grown in terms of leadership opportunities through what netball enabled me to do and others to do as well. The the success in uh, the Commonwealth Games was. Um, uh, certainly here in the UK was really powerfully felt because of England winning in 2018. Uh, following that up with the World Netball Cup in Liverpool in 2019 um, has had a massive impact in terms of the numbers of people now actually signing up for netball here in the UK. Uh, similarly, as we take it, this event around the world, it will happen in this, it'll have the similar impact. And in 2023, the Netball World Cup is in South Africa. Um, it will be have an amazing impact, not only in South Africa, but on the African nation. Yeah, it's going to be really great to see that impact it has, especially with how well the African nations did in Liverpool as well. Um, finally, every sporting competition in the world has been affected by this COVID-19 outbreak. Like you say, it probably be 2021 by the time we get back to normal. 2021 is, is when we'll see the largest sporting event in the world take place, finally, the Olympics, which is something... You're very familiar with with your previous roles in the Olympics and Paralympics very well. Can you see netball being an Olympic sport in future? I don't think it's going to happen in the short term. I think the important thing is to be very clear about the criteria that the uh, Olympic Committee uses when uh, judging whether events should be in or out. We're thinking about uh, the Fast Five uh, netball as a product which might be um, a more attractive in terms of that possibility. Um, and uh, that we're planning to test that out at the Commonwealth Youth Games, actually, in, uh, uh, when, it's, when it's next held uh, next year. But at the heart of it, it's about eyeballs on the sport. It's about how many people really are followers of this sport, how many people are around the world. So we have got to grow our sport in order to be able to be credible applicant, We've got to grow the number of nations that are regularly competing, We've got to grow the number of supporters and followers. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so that's what we're working on. So our strategy, we're doing it for ourselves, it's good for netball anyway, but as a consequence, it should position us better in the future for that Olympic opportunity. Liz, thank you so much for taking time to speak to us this morning, much appreciated. You're welcome. You're welcome. Liz Nicholl, three key things that I took from that interview with Hannah, the, the global calendar being the top priority for INF going forward, which I'm sure you'd give a big tick to Tamsin. The, Thank the, you. There you go. Uh, Super League games uh, and Super Leagues being a change of the sport across South Africa, New Zealand, Australia and, and England. So the importance of the league structure up against the internationals. And that final point, just briefly on the Fast Five as a, I hate to use that word product, but Fast Five as a concept being what INF will take forward to the Olympics. To see someone engaged that wants to be proactive on all three levels has got to be good for the sport, right? Absolutely brilliant. I think um, some great points made. Leagues across the world have been fantastic for all players involved. I want to see more African and Caribbean nations um, involved, though. Um, more Pacific Islanders, that kind of thing. We need to keep pushing for that. Um, and I think you can see that that's clearly on their agenda. Um, the Olympics, absolutely brilliant. I've been saying for a long time, full netball sevens for me, do, it does not bother me in the Olympics at all. Having a fast five version sitting alongside sort of a rugby sevens type tournament thing, I think would work perfectly. Um, and I think it's a great, great opportunity, great idea. And hopefully with someone like Liz in charge, it's something we can really push forward. I wonder if we'll see our next guest at the Olympics, if and when Fast Five happens, because Siggy Berg has been a bit of a revelation when it comes to the Super League. I know we've only had a few rounds, but already she's shown for London Pulse what she's made of. Here is, start the theme tune, Ziggy in the middle.
Ziggy Burger, we were going to call this Ziggy in the Middle just to try and use something with your name. Have you heard of Piggy in the Middle? Yeah, of course. I think I used to love playing it, but people didn't like playing it with me because I was so tall. So like them trying to throw high, I just like be like, okay, I'll get the, I'll take the ball in the air. <laughs> How have you been? How have you found isolation? I've really been loving it. I've been, you know, working on a lot of netball things, and then also been reading a lot. I've started my own YouTube channel, so you know, I've been quite busy. <laughs> I love, I am totally subscribed to the YouTube channel, you and James Thacker. So we should explain, uh, James is the other part in the isolation videos. He's who you were living with at the moment and hopefully for time immemorial, let's say that. Uh, he's a great <laughs> Has, have you been doing kind of fitness workouts together? Yeah, so um, Jay, I've been living with James and um, the future in-laws and with that comes two, uh, three boys, so it's James and his two brothers. And yeah, so we've been doing lots of fitness. It took them a few days to watch me shoot and now they're shooting me out the park. So, you know, it's been really good. I've been, I've been practicing my passings because I've got people who are really enthusiastic to join. So, you know, it's been really good. You didn't need to improve. You were totally acing this season, weren't you, before the pause? You were top of the, the shooting stats and everything was going. What changed, Ziggy? What, I'm not saying you weren't great before, but there seems to have been a, like a difference in confidence with you. When I play for South Africa, I have no confidence. Like, I'm so, you can see I'm so stressed when I'm out on court. Like, the way I play for Pulse is like so different to when I play internationally. So I think it definitely is just Sam Bird, who's been such a good coach. And she called me in just before the season started and she said, you know, Ziggy, weirdly enough, you're one of the more older experienced players because in Pulse, it feels like everyone is 18 years old. Um, so she's like, and you have all the experience and you really are good enough. I need you to go and be confident on court now because by you being confident and being dominant in your position, it will give other, um, like the players around you, the confidence and like they'll also just settle. So I definitely think it's been Sam and then also Daniel Laverpool, our strength and conditioning coach. So it's really just been like getting my strength and conditioning up to scratch and Sam Bird mentally telling us basically you know brainwashing us to tell us we're great uh, which works so yeah. Ziggy we, we've enjoyed seeing you top of the of the stats I love talking to you every week when we get the chance when the netball super league's here but but I saw you retweet the uh, draft central list of the players the top 10 players they'd love to see over in Suncorp uh, representing South Africa at number nine Snella Bimbella was in there but you weren't there. How much do you want to be there? How much would you love to go and play in Australia? Um, I would 100% love to go play in Australia one day in the future when the time is right and I'm on my game enough that a club would be willing to invest in me. Um, I don't think there's any player that wouldn't love that opportunity just because um, Suncorp are at that stage where you can already you know, do that as your full-time job there and learn so much and just you know fully embrace yourself in netball so I mean it would be an amazing dream for me to do that even if that meant coming back after two seasons or whatever to England because I would never um you know have anything negative to say about the Vitality Netball Super League as that has been such a like a reason my netball is where it is today like so yeah I would love to go um if any clubs ever would want me but yeah definitely definitely not out like there so yeah so maybe one day who knows i thought that when you did that i thought you were going to show us an engagement ring i thought you and james were engaged funny story that i've got to tell you so i told james that if he ever did want to propose to me it would need to be somewhere like at the end of a Nations Cup or 2022 Commonwealth Games or something. How all the NBA players have it or NFL, you know, propose, proposing in front of a full crowd. I would love it. Like going down on his knee, get all the good angles we needed from every option. And, you know, me sweaty hair up. Beautiful. <laughs> uh, Ziggy Berger, I look forward to that moment. I look forward to talking to you again very, very soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. <laughs> 
Pulse and South Africa's shooter, Ziggy Bird. I know it's only been quick, but that confidence that she says she's seen a different player, personally, herself, playing for Pulse as for South Africa. Also, this, this great mention of uh, the top 10 players that Netball Draft Central have done on who could be in the Suncor, or at least who they'd like to see. Having a quick look for it, uh, Vimbella, South Africa, is in there. Joyce and Vula. Raz Kwashi, who we said for a long time, is a real star. Fran Williams and George Fisher, two of your products. But I love at number three in this list uh, of Draft Central top 10 players to see in the Suncorp, Jade Clark. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to retire. <laughs> oh, it's brilliant, isn't it? And, and it's good for the older players as well. I know we all get very excited about the new youngsters coming through, and so we should, but I've, I've said it for a long time. We should give credit to those players that perform every single year and have done for years on, on end, playing with those players, coaching those players. Trust me, you need those guys in the game. And someone like Jay Clark um, is, you know, as good as she was 10 years ago, uh, if not better from an experience point of view and what she adds to the team now as well. So, um, yeah, it's really nice to see somebody like JD because she, uh, she's such a good mate as well and she's such a good person, get that recognition because she's often sort of overlooked, I guess, for some of the they're more sort of superstars in the team. But yeah, JD, great player, someone you'd always want in your team. Uh, a side note, I'm really loving the, some of these polls that they're doing across Netball Scoop, Draft Centre as well, that are keeping everyone going at the moment, keeping that conversation going. Use the hashtag off the court. Up next, though, we are going inside the inner sanctum of Tamsin's house. Thank goodness for the rain, because this is what you can do inside. Here's Tamsin's drill. <laughs> Okay, so the challenge was set high this week. Uh, because of the rain, it's kind of put a halt to all my videos. Um, and Barker asked me to do one that's indoors. Now there's always stuff you can be practicing. I've had a few requests about this. It's actually about the three foot mark. So um, what we're gonna do, we're gonna have my lovely feeder here. Well, when you think about it, it's setting out a meter, so she's gonna be back in a little bit. Okay, and every time she tosses up that ball, so it's out good, you're going to get back and get those arms up. Now the thing with three foot marking, I see so many things. I see one arm over, I see really leaning and off balance. And when you think about feet, I don't know if you can go down a little bit. Feet shoulder width apart, perfect. Knees slightly bent, and then if you come back up, yep, uh, down a little bit. Perfect, then we stay in this position. So we're nice and tall and nice and big. You're trying to stop the vision. What I don't want you to do either is following the ball around like this because it stops it for about a second and then they're able to get that ball around you. So if you toss it up again to yourself, okay, bump with there and we're in this big, nice, tall position. Now, if the player does start to move it around a little bit, move the ball around, you can just slightly move your hands rather than massively following. Um, I also want you to have a look at this. Throw the ball up again. This time when we get five foot and we've been bigger, we actually block that range. So this time as the player moves it around a little bit more, you can actually really cover that ball without having to do this massive unbalanced movement. Um, I know people like to jump the ball as well, so I want to show you a little trick. Often if you put your hands up, you can't get the elevation. So if we look at it this time, she's going to throw the ball up to herself. We're going to get back and we're going to keep her arms down. So it looks open as she throws the ball. Boom! We jump to it and we smother. We go and we smother that ball. So yeah, so again, if you take that ball, throw it up. So we're here, we keep our arms down, and boom, we jump up to smother it. The last thing I want you to think about is how you step off this, up off the three foot mile. The temptation is to step up towards the player. I want you to think about stepping off. So as this ball goes past you, you step off into the space, and as the defender starts to attack and come back, you can get into that position to defend them. So it's this step off that's important. As the ball goes past this way, we step off, and into space and we get them on our back foot. So we're constantly practicing that angle off rather than that step up. It's carnage, but it'll be fun. Have a go. Is there anything you can't do, Tamsin Greenway? Through the keyhole and into the inner sanctum of Tamsin Greenway. <laughs> this week. Stop it, stop it. We have to be sensible now because we've got a big guest coming up. He's always been known as the man with the golden whistle. Now he's the man with the golden tonsils. Gary Burgess, the best umpire in the land, joins us next. We used to seeing him with the golden whistle in his hand and his mouth, and now it's just his golden tonsils. Gary Burgess, the top dog when it comes to umpiring, is here with us. Hello, Gary. Hello, how are you? Uh, well, what is that in the background? Is that an England netball dress? Was it ever worn by you? 
No, never worn by me, thank goodness. I think that creates too many mental pictures, doesn't it? Um, that was a dress that the Roses gave me when I umpired my 100th international match at the uh, 2019 World Cup. So a prized possession. And you've been everywhere in the nicest possible sense, but you and your singing uh, has, has done the rounds. You're a viral sensation. Well, I don't know about that, but um, we, it, was, it was coincidental, really. Um, those people would know uh, the legend of Team White, Sheila Redpath. She linked us to a video of a lady playing uh, the piano. It was absolutely beautiful, and I clocked her and realised it was someone that I passed, uh, called Lynn uh, Withy. I passed her for a Sea Award uh, umpiring um, certificate about nine years ago. So I did a little bit of a, a secret call to her and just said, do you want to do a duet and um, to, to cheer Sheila up? And that it just, it's gone wild since then. We are going to get you to play us out. Um, Tamsin's kindly agreed to do a duet with you. Yes, <laughs> finally, my moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Uh, before that, though, whilst we've got you, we might as well harvest that brilliant brain of yours and talk through a few things that have puzzled us over the last season, <laughs> all three games of it, or however many we saw in, in the end. Uh, we started the season with this new hope and a, a new sub rule, Tamsin. You've had a little look back at, at the first game of Super 10. This was Sirens 51, Pulse 53. And what is it you wanted to focus on? Well, uh, this was the first time we'd used a new sub rule. Uh, it didn't quite go to plan, and we're not going to get Gary to comment on that. Um, however, I think everybody's been crying out for this for this new rule, and I just wanted to hear your sort of thoughts from it from an umpiring perspective, and thoughts moving it on even further into a sort of rolling subs theme. So this was when uh, a Pulse player came on and then was sent off because it didn't happen properly. That aside, what are you looking for? What should be happening, and what are your thoughts on it? So the, the issue that occurred with that um, specific application was that it was in, in, indeed that the player had assumed that it was a rolling sub where um, we were very clear in the pre-season and the rules trial that we were taking on board for the INF that rolling subs aren't part of netball in this country at the moment and, and the INF are very uh, protective of the traditional format of netball and, and whilst um, the concept of getting rid of these non-legitimate or people do call them fake injuries is a priority. They do want to kind of stick as close to the true format of netball and the traditional format of netball. And anywhere going near rolling subs is a bit too close to basketball. So the problem actually occurred because the player didn't ask them for the time. Um, that, that's why that occurred. But we're, I think we're all in agreement, aren't we, Tamsin, that actually to get rid of the, the fake hobbling. On what, and off the little finger? <laughs> The, the painful little finger that needs to come off the court. Gary and I have had many of those moments across the past few years. I'm, I'm glad that sub will come in. I'm, I'm actually with you, Gary. I'm against the rolling subs for lots of different reasons from a coaching perspective. But I think um, the sub rule as it stands now is so much better in that format. On to something not contentious at all. Uh, this is Latanya Wilson getting sent. Dragons 57, Bath 71. This isn't round so, all right, again, maybe not commenting on the process of this. We did it for about three weeks running, didn't we, Tamsin? Um, but what's, what's the process then? Explain the step by step by step to getting a player sent off. Yeah, so I think the, the, the main thing I will say to everybody is that the uh, objective of the umpire is to keep all 14 players on the court. That's what we go out to do every single game. Um, but ultimately, it's the responsibility of the player to change their behaviour, to stay on the court. The umpire will give you enough hints, um, either with quiet words, with whistles, with words that aren't so quiet and are quite forthright. Um, and it's the job of the umpire to make 100% clear to the player uh, that their behaviour needs to change. Now, unfortunately, um, there is a, a, a kind of a facet in the rule where players can do certain things uh, which will lead to automatic cautions um, and automatic warning. So it might be a one-off situation. And those are the things that kind of not necessarily upset um, spectators um, on TV or in the arenas, but that's what causes um, confusion because what could seem like a quite innocuous action could lead to the first step of the game management ladder. Now, you know, that might be an intentional obstruction um, that, tips the balance but what what you you know what everyone needs to understand is that there are certain uh, things that can happen so once you've got a caution under the new rules you can get cautions for other behavior but actually the umpire needs to be thinking on whether or not that uh, behavior is designed to delay play or is is covered under foul play but ultimately if you're on a warning you're not going to get another warning the next step is a sub, uh, is a, a suspension if you're on a suspension the next step is an order off so anything that would be covered I mean, if you use the football analogy, God, you know, God forbid, 
if you've got a yellow card, um, the only option is next, you're going to get a second yellow and it will be a red. So that's the kind of thing, there's no turning back once you've got a, a warning or if you've been suspended. We've said for a long time, haven't we, Tamsin, that actually if we can get a graphic, particularly on TV games, down in the corner with you, Gary, doing all your, your That's warnings. a warning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, you, you've got the job, Tamsin, you can do it. Right, the I, next one that you want to look at is, is off the ball stuff, and there's loads of this happening, Tamsin. Yes, I want to do some analysis this week on off the ball stuff and why I've got you here, Gary. It's kind of my big thing at the moment, especially as a coach and being an ex-player. Um, so I've picked out some clips internationally and from the Super League as well. I'm just going to talk you through them. So the first one is Courtney Bruce, and this is against South Africa. Um, and I just want you to keep an eye on Bruce here and uh, her position in our pot heater. Um, and as the ball finally does come in, which you're going to see in a minute, just look out for her left arm and how she pulls herself around pot heater. Now, she actually gets pulled up for that one. Um, but if we move on to our next clip, which is against uh, New Zealand in the World Cup final, this one's quite interesting because she doesn't get pulled up for it. Um, it's going to come into, into shot in a second, but again, she uses that arm to play herself around Epinazio. Now, as she pulls around, the ball gets misplaced from Maria Palau, and the ball actually goes out of play, which is the call that, that gets there. Um, and after this, we're going to get to see a little bit of a replay of it as well. Now, it doesn't look so bad, but I know being in the circle, when you're pulled around like that, how bad it can be from your positioning, where you feed the ball and what you can do with your arms. Now, it's not just a defensive issue. I've picked out some clips from the Nations Cup, and you're going to pick up Whitney uh, Sooners here coming out on a centre pass. Again, she uses her right arm to block off Laura Malcolm before she plays out for the ball. Um, and then we've got a close-up of um, Sh uh, Shannon Brantola and uh, Jay Clark just having a little larger bargy, hooking their arms in there. And these arm locks are happening all the time. Um, my final clip is from the Super League in 2017. I picked out this because it's st stuck in my mind. Now, this was a goal-for-goal -goal game in the dying minutes. Um, and the TV angle, which is what we show you first, just the penalty pass into Rachel Dunn that doesn't look like anything under the post, she slots away the goal. From the analysis angle, which I have from my own coaching analysis, you can clearly see, and we play it through slowly, that Joe Tripp um, is hooking Rachel Dunn's arm. Now, from your positioning where you are and, and from what everybody else can see, it doesn't look like anything, but Rachel has to use her arm to pull off. Now, we get away with it. But there's such a fine line now between attacking contact, between what the umpire is seeing, whether it's a reaction to being hooked or whether you're doing the hooking first. I mean, it's become like this relentless task. Is it a player responsibility now, a coach responsibility? Are you guys aware of it? Do you think it's just part of the game and it's something we've got to suck up? We talk about this contact, non-contact game, but there is so much now happening off the ball that I think it's having a real effect on what is happening during the games. Yeah, so I think you make a good point, Tamsin. I think uh, this is, the, you know, these sorts of things are, are best discussed with coaches in training sessions to actually identify where the intent lies. But the, the first point that you made, um, the, the arms out and the holds that come round and the wraps that come round, in our, in our view, from an umpire point of view, they're in place to stop rolls, often from shooters, so they roll around to get in and, and the block comes in. Now, my tip would be for umpires, the best way to see those is every time play moves or players move, so if the ball swings and you're in the goal circle, the umpire has got to reposition every time. I think sometimes umpires get stuck, static, and play will develop and move around them and they're still in the position because they've been told to take up a strong position. But in actual fact, really what you should be doing is every time is moving, adjust and readjust again to keep finding gaps. Because if you stand still, you only see bodies and blocks. Whereas if you keep moving, you, you keep getting, uh, you keep seeing the gaps. Now, the other thing to point out on this is often the TV or camera angle is a better angle than what the umpire had. <laughs> uh, and you pair that with, you know, I don't, I'm not a coach. I, I, I do go into coaching sessions and do go into training sessions, but... Is this being coached? Is, is, is the blind side effectively, the best umpires don't have a blind side, but actually umpires are human, so everyone's going to have one. Um, are they being trained to hold where they think the umpire can't see? A big tip to coaches and players is, just because it's the active umpire that might not be seeing, the other umpire that's still on the transverse line looking straight in at this all turning up is going to be ready for this to come up their end in the second quarter and then again in the fourth. So there's always that way that you can be looking out for this stuff. Um, so it, it is something that we're aware of. You're never ever going to get every every single one of them, but certainly the, the example you gave with um, with Jade and Shannon, that sort of thing will probably get left um, 
But again, if you're looking at umpiring theory on it, it will be the first thing. We're looking for the first thing. So let's say, for instance, two players are tracking across each other. It's when they first come together where the first trigger point would happen. Um, then if they then continue to travel together, that's again where we'd be looking for this push, shove, grab, hold. And then eventually when the ball's then in possession, that's the next bit that we're looking for. Just briefly, do you think there should be more umpires on court? No, I don't think they should. I think um, I do think the two umpires that are on court need to be given uh, more credit on what they actually do see. Um, I've said for many, many years that umpires are only ever really remembered for uh, the mistakes they make or if once in a while they fall over. That kind of gets people going a bit, doesn't it, Caroline? <laughs> but I think, um, I think it's, you know, give the umpires credit. When the, umpire is, um, uh, when the game is umpired well, it is the difference between... Uh, and it's, it's, not, it's not solely about the umpires, but it's the difference between spectators sitting in their seats and having the game umpired by numbers for them, or mm. when the umpire plays some really skillful contest or some really skillful advantage. You know, it has to be the players that make fantastic passes, but that added all together gets people on the edge of their seats and gets them excited. It I was. actually really agree with that. And I think you raise a really good point. And that's why I mentioned the players and coaches. You can't possibly see everything. And I'd hate to think that things like that are being coached. And I actually think players have got to take a bigger responsibility now because there's a lot of, what me? You know, you know there's a line, there's contests, and there's going to be contacts and there's going to be body on body. But you don't have to ever go and deliberately hook or hold in certain ways. There's enough skillful players out there showing you that you don't need to do it. And so I think it's something that we've got to address moving forward because like you say, we want the, the game to be memorable for the game, for the action. Yeah, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think one of the things that we potentially could look at as umpires is, or, or the rules panel is when this grabbing and this hooking does occur, that you're actually looking at higher level game management stuff. Could that be a new um, intentional caution, you know, an intentional caution? Could the first time that happen? Because certainly if you start doing things like that, it eradicates that from the game. But again, ultimately, the best umpires will always say contact, wing defence. It's always the wing defence in my advantage, in my example. So apologies, wing defence. But you know, always them. <laughs> yeah. it's always them, Gary. Oh, absolutely. But you're holding onto her arm. Um, that's that's a real kind of trigger for those players to know that that behaviour has been spotted and been spotted early. All right. Well, if you want to hear more from Gary, and why wouldn't you? Uh, you can join him on Facebook. And one of the joys, actually, of you, Gary, but of the sport, too, is that the umpires are accessible. We do hear from you and we do get those explanations. The other joy of you is coming up in just a bit. Gary is going to sing us out. First, though, here's some of your social. So our first bit of social, uh, this was spotted by many from Australia, which is... <laughs> We've seen that, that Joe Weston is brilliant on the court, but her dance moves also a little bit special. Uh, I think we've got better moves in our lock, haven't we, Barker? I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, we, we keep threatening that. this, we keep threatening. If they keep coming at us, we're going to have to give something back. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to happen. Uh, this might happen, though, or might need to be recreated. This is Serena Guthrie. I think you, Gary, and you, Tamsin, will be used to her dance moves. This was celebrating Sasha Corman's birthday. And loads of superstars turned up for this, but Serena's dancing was um, gold medal standard, right? That was pretty impressive. I've seen many of those moves left on a bath nightclub over the years, so I'm, I'm pleased that she's still got them in her locker. Yeah, that is probably best uh, left unsaid. Uh, as for singing... Sing is gonna be a long, long time. This is, can I just remind you, World Cup winning coach Nolan Tura singing out uh, any of the, the Sue Gorgian clips that you'll see. She gets every one of her guests at the end to, to sing, which we're about to rip off completely, Gary. You'll be on this soon, surely, won't you? She, she got you singing yet? I, uh, I am friends with Super G. I, uh, I, I'm waiting for the call. I dare say she'll try and stitch me up at some point. Talking of stitching up, uh, this is what happens when Tamsin trying to record her drills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was a poor edit. I, I can't complain too much. I've walked in behind so many of his kitchen meetings in the past few weeks, so um, he thought he was being a bit of a comedian. Uh, that's your other half, Joe, with baby Casey Jackson, you see regularly on the show. We're going to end with Gary singing us out. So then, Gary, what song have you chosen? Well, I, uh, I've got a really, as I said, really fantastic pianist, Lynn, and I think this, uh, this piece of music uh, showcases her skill more than it does mine. But we're going to go for a little bit of my way, if that's all right.
Uh, have you got the music accompaniment or do I need Oh, absolutely, boxing? absolutely. She's got to get the credit she deserves. Are you ready? Okay, yes. Hands in. Yes, there were times I'm sure you knew when I bit off more than I could chew. And through it all, when there was doubt, I ate it up and spat it out. Are you ready for your big finish? I faced it all and I stood tall and did it did all it my way. way. Great friends. Oh, Woo. I'll go for the big applause. He's still milking his moment. <laughs> Gorgeous. That's all right for you. It was beautiful. I mean, let down, let's face it, by the singing exploits of Tamsin there. But you guys. Well, I thought we were all joining in. You said, Am I ready? I'm always ready, Gary. Always. I was doing the lip syncing challenge. <laughs> That's what happened. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Gary guys. Burgess, you are the man with the golden whistle and now the golden tonsils. If people want to follow you, and why wouldn't they on social media? to watch and see and listen, not just for the umpiring, but the singing too. How can they get in touch? Uh, Gary Burgess, IUA, uh, um, on Twitter. And then um, we're doing the best content out of the England Netball Officiating Facebook page. So a little sneaky uh, programme called uh, Officiating Netflix on there people can catch up with. We've had Michelle Fippard from Australia, the Corbyn sisters, Louise Travis, yours truly. And we've got a few surprises coming up too. Gary Burgess, a delight. Tams in Greenway, Casey Jacks, equally a delight. Thank you to everyone for listening and watching and maybe singing along too. We're back next week. Remember, you can get in touch. Use the hashtag <laughs> off the court. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Sky Sports. Feel it all.